the real Sue Thomas is here from Vermont. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. It's great to be with you. You have such a story, and it begins in a very difficult place. 18 months old, you lost your hearing. Why? At the time, it was due to unknown causes, but today, they believe that it's suspected I could have had multiple sclerosis, MS, at a very early age, mm -hmm. but it's only known to God. Before I stand before him and have the whole story revealed as far as the why, when, and how, mm -hmm. that day, I'll find out. Your parents were given no encouragement. They were encouraged to put you in an institution. All right. Basically, you know, before the foundation of time, God set the blueprint of my life, giving me the parents that I would need, the friends as well. And as I always share with parents of any child that might be coming over an adversity or a disability, before the foundation of time, God knew that you would have the strength and the wisdom for that child to be placed in your hand. Basically, what God's home and the determination of, of strong, spirited parents there really isn't anything that a child can't do today. Amazing. We have a photograph of you. I think at how old? How old here? That's shortly after I lost my hearing. I mean, a little old after 18 months. And if you look at my eyes, there's a lostness there. Mm. I'm really missing something. You know, for the first 18 months having my hearing, then suddenly to have it go, mm. I'm not familiar with my surroundings. That's one of my earliest pictures of my deafness. You were the only deaf child in right. your public school district. Yes, and that created a problem big time. They really didn't know how to work with me. And so more or less, I would just pass from class to class, sitting in the classroom in the silence, not understanding. Sometimes I got the question, but I never got the answer. Hmm. You had persevering people, not just your parents, right. who, in, who did encourage you. As I share with people, the story is simply not my own story. It's for all those that ever walked the journey with me, that believed in me, that gave a part of their lives to me to help make me and to mold me what I am today. I want you to see this picture. Uh, youngest Ohio State champion freestyle skater at seven years old. Wow. Wow. How did you skate to the music? Once again, it would be another life. My coach took it upon himself to skate hand in hand with me at the correct beat of that music over and over. When I finally had a down pat, he'd be standing on the outside of the ring, perfectly still. All of a sudden, he'd be jumping up and down, waving his hands, and that was a single to take off the music song. So it was my job simply to do all the time that he taught me to be able to do it on that given day. So again, another life, okay, another gift from God. Do you hear anything at all? Well, about two times a year. At least that's what my traveling companion said. With an A, there are some sound with the right frequency and decimal loss. Very, very few. It could be a siren, but it's not every ambulance, it's not every fire truck. Again, depends upon the decimal and the frequency. The same thing. I've been known to hear a stealth fighter jet, okay? But a 737, a 747, absolutely nothing. And that is only with an aid on. Once that aid is removed, it's a total silence. And people always say, well, why do you wear it? Once I lost my hearing, the doctor told my parents to put aids on me. If there was an, ever an opportunity for me to ever be able to have any sound, to give me that opportunity. For me, it's like putting shoes on the first thing and taking them off at night. It just kind of comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. It's a part of me. An amazing gift for lip reading. Yes, and your, your parents encouraged that. Well, I had to learn to speak. I lost my hearing at the age of 18 months. I was baby talking. I had no speech. So the therapist came in. I sat in front of the mirror with her, forming my mouth as she formed her mouth. Seven years of speech therapy in front of a mirror. I tell people, anybody can do it. Just brush your teeth and start talking to yourself in front of the mirror. Seven years later, you'll work for the FBI with me. 
<laughs> okay, next picture, Sue. Explain this to me. You're not just posing here. You uh, are playing. I had a mother that loved music, and she wanted to pass the love on to her daughter, whether she could hear it or not. And about the age of five, they brought the piano in, and I'm pounding the keyboards, and I loved it. It's vibrations I've never experienced. But then the novelty wore off, and I just wanted to go outside and play football with my brothers. <laughs> but my mom was persistent that I was going to have the love of music over and over. And her famous words was, someday you're going to thank me for this. And <laughs> it's a universal saying on mother's lips everywhere. And they're right. I thank God for the time, for the persistence thing that she made me step behind that piano because I came to appreciate the vibe. I studied classical piano, oh. Beethoven, the deep vibe, the concertos, as far as I, I love it. The music reflects my mood. And as I told Bill and Gloria Gaither, music starts inside first, and then it's released, and you hear it. Before you can ever hear it, it has to be created within. And I'm convinced that all deaf people have that creation that has been planted from the beginning of time. Why? Because God planted that in his people for music, to be able to worship him, to adore him, to songs of praise. So it's something that's already there. We just have to tap into it. Wow. Wow. Springfield College in Massachusetts, you had months of looking for a job, and then the FBI came after you. Yeah, that was pretty interesting when I found out that the FBI was looking for deaf people. I mean, I really panicked. I thought to myself, what did we do? <laughs> you studied political science and international affairs. Yes. But I think your ability to lip read was most valuable to the yes, FBI. Yes, it was. Uh, I became the FBI's secret weapon. Basically, people will say, well, what did you do for him? Well, I followed the bad guys around, and I read their lips, and I told the good guys what the bad guys were saying, and they even paid me to do it, too. <laughs> we have a couple of great picks. Look at this first. How old were you? How, what age? Oh, I'm probably in my early 30s. Wow. And oh, next one is the G-Man. I love this next pick. Oh, you didn't actually use guns. Oh, yeah, that's me and my Thompson 45 submachine gun. We were going down on the firing range with the agents and practiced our target shooting. And what was very interesting on the range for ear protection, everybody had to wear those protective ears. And it was by law that we did that. And so for myself, I wore them because I had to be in accordance with the law. But I never put them on this way. I always put them on this way because there wasn't anything to protect with my ears. <laughs> you sure know how to have fun. And who would have thought that your life would be portrayed so well on the screen. Yeah, incredible. You see, when I found out that they wanted to make a TV show, they came to me and they asked me who I wanted to play the part. And it was a, a no-brainer for me. I responded simply by saying, I want a nice, tall, thin blonde <laughs> to make me look real good. Well, I got it. Well, you know, it's been said that Deanna Bray is, uh, has perfectly embodied the persona of Sue Thomas. Uh, she does a really good, yeah. really, really good. She's got such a very sweet spirit, very high energetic. Now here you are on the set with the producer. And, and there she is, tall, thin and blonde. <laughs> Just exactly what you ordered, uh, with a matching dog. Right, you know, when they first filmed the, they wanted to name my dog Amazing Grace. That was the dog that I had at the time. But I asked that the dog be named Levi. Levi was my first hearing dog, and he was the dog that taught me to hear. So in his honor, we used Levi as the name. Isn't that wonderful? And, you know, just watching the show again last night, it, it's truly wonderful how God, your faith, is reflected in the series. He's not edited out. <laughs> it has to be, because that's who I am. And you know, as I've traveled the world and I've talked with the TV show about the TV show, I come to remember, everybody remembers Sir Thomas with the TV show. And I don't want to be remembered that way. 
I want to be remembered as Sir Thomas, the woman of faith that had a tremendously deep love for God and a deep appreciation. The show is just a stepping stone. It is a key that unlocks the door for the world to come to know who I am. As I go forth, people think they get this celebrity coming to spring. And in reality, they're getting God's greatest sinner that has been saved by his grace and grace alone. My one desire that when I came to the foot of the cross is that he would allow me to go forth to every nation to stand before every generation to proclaim him. I didn't realize that he would use the TV show to do it mm -hmm. because the show is, is being seen in 64 nations around the world. We get emails from Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, Germany, Japan, you name it, we get it. And wherever that TV show goes, the story has to go with it of the transforming, the power of God, the cross, and the redemption of Jesus Christ. On the way to speak to 10,000 people in Dallas, you had numbness mm -hmm. in your fingers, went all the way to your head. Mm -hmm. You were diagnosed with MS. I was, I was on my way to Dallas, Texas to speak at a huge woman conference about 15,000. And right before I was going, I was experiencing symptoms. And that night when I was on the platform, right in the middle, I had an episode that I've never had in my life. And I looked out at the woman and I said, we're gonna pause for station identification. I'll be right back. And I knew I had to get off. I had to be revived. And I just told the, the music team to sing until I came back. And I went to the woman's restroom and I just poured cold water on me as far as that I had no idea what was going on. And I went back out and, and I finished my address that night. And right after, they took me right to the hospital. And I had cast scans and different things and we made them. When we returned, I got the voting that it was MS. I'm as the journey that would totally be changing the direction of my path. Mm -hmm. For those years, I had coped with the path of fighting, embracing it after going to the cross. It was the thing that I despised until my transformation. And now a new challenge was before me to walk humbly with my God with MS. Was I going to mumble and grumble or was I going to embrace it? And I thought I would make it a lot easier on myself if I just embraced it and walked with him on a daily basis with it. It's been nine years, and slowly but surely, I, I keep kind of going down here just a little bit, moving real slowly now. And there was one time I said, the day that I could not stand would be the day that my speaking crew would be over. And through the years, God has taught me whether I said, whether I stand, whether I lie down, I will always proclaim him. So he's keeping me on the road. We're still going to churches and showing that faithful story of the love and the forgiveness of God.